Okay, hello again, and this is another In Conservation With episode. My name is David Lindo, and tonight is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. So thank you very much. Um, very interesting subject tonight um, with Tessa Bose, my guest. Um, Tessa and I go back a short way, a couple of years, three years maybe, Tessa? Yep, three years, bird fair. That's right. But um, Tessa has the distinction as being the first person in a hundred people we've interviewed on In Conservation to do it standing up. She's actually standing up as we speak, <laughs> which I think is incredible. Fantastic, Tessa. So anyway, how are you and where in the world are you? I am very well, thank you, David. And I'm in Hastings on the South Coast. Um, been in the sea today. And um, yeah, I'm surrounded by seagulls, barking dogs, gaming teenager downstairs. I hope he keeps quiet. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's a busy time because I've got a, a, a statue campaign on the go and we are waiting to see if Boris is allowing us to have our launch party or not on the 1st of July. I'll be telling you a bit more about that later. So um, that? slightly on tenterhooks today, I'd say. Yeah, it all sounds pretty exciting. For those who don't know Tessa, she's a, a social historian and an author. She's written um, a couple of books. How many books have you written, actually? I've written two books. Yeah, I thought, I, I thought you had written two, including this one here, which uh, was something else before, wasn't it? It was Mrs. Pankhurst's Purple Feather, which has now been sort of rebranded as Etta Lemon, which is well, who is? Um, in the person we're going to be talking about a lot tonight, um, but more about that in a second. Let me ask you about you though, Tessa. Um, how did you kind of, I mean, where did you grow up and did you uh, come to nature sort of naturally or was there some kind of moment when you suddenly realised this is quite beautiful? I, I'd never really thought about nature as being a thing apart. I guess I'm, I'm very lucky in that I did grow up um, in a, a rural village on the Ashdown Forest, famous for Winnie the Pooh, 100 Acre Wood, that's where I grew up. And um, I had a mother who could name every wildflower because she was made to uh, sketch them at school, so she taught me the names. My dad grew up in Uganda, he was a real birder, rather dismissive about British bird life after his um, first half of his life spent in East Africa. But um, yeah, he gave me a love of nature. I suppose we were all a David and Attenborough addicts. Um, any wildlife on the television or black and white television would be watching it. 25 years in London intervened and it's been lovely moving back to Sussex, particularly lovely last year, I have to say, in lockdown. I think that's when I really reconnected far more profoundly with my rural roots and the seasons. So how long have you been in Hastings? Seven years, I think now. Yes. Yeah. It's a nice town, Hastings, actually. I've been, I've been around there a few times um, and obviously some lovely houses and right next to the sea. It's all good news, really, isn't it? Yes. And also the, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Hastings rarities scandal. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting um, topic, actually, which I love to talk with someone about one day. But, but well, I may, may, obviously you probably know more about it in terms of describing it off the top of your head, but it is a, a very famous scandal that happened, when was it, during the 18, sort of mid-1800s? Uh, no, it was, it was this, I was going to say, it's the 20th century, um, and a lot of uh, foreign birds were, were stuffed and displayed as British birds, and um, to give a, a bird collector some kind of kudos here. And the taxidermist lives, lived on a road just, just around the corner from me, uh, Mr. Bristow, and uh, the book I'd love to write is called Mrs. Bristow's Freezer, if she had a freezer, because there were some very extraordinary specimens coming and going. And uh, yeah, it's a fascinating story, oh, but God. perhaps not one for tonight. Yeah, I'd love to, love to uh, read that book because the, the Hastings rarity thing is, has been mumbling on to this day, you know, amongst you know, some of the more hardcore birders, because there's been several species on that that list of birds that were procured and sort of sold on as 
as kosher in terms of being found in UK have since turned up in UK. So it's really quite interesting how that all came to be. But tonight, obviously, we're not talking about that, that being for another day, as you say. We're talking about um, your book and talking about one of the people within the book, um, well, actually several people, but certainly uh, one in particular, Etta Lemon, who um, I suppose along with her colleagues were the founders of what we know as today as the RSPB, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And independently, a few years ago, I mean, I've, I've been writing for the RSPB's birds magazine, now called uh, Nature's Home, um, for about maybe 12 years. And I remember when I first started writing, and I remember sort of looking into the RSPB and realising that, because I did a piece on um, Manchester actually once, and I wrote about Didsbury, and I found out that these women um, were sort of clubbing together to, to form the organisation, and I thought, well, if that's the case, how come I don't see any evidence of that? When I walk into the headquarters, how come I'm not greeted by, you know, some beautiful, glorious oil paintings of, of each woman? Uh, how come I haven't seen a statue in the, in the front, you know, in, in front of the building? And I, I wondered that for years. And then you came along. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Um... I, I think that those early female founders, I mean, they were Christian, they were women, and in the end, they were elderly. They weren't elderly at the start, they were in their prime, but um, they, they ran this early society for its first 50 years, and by the time they were turfed out, they were in their kind of 70s, 80s, and I I think the RSPB just wanted to move on. It didn't want to be associated with you know, God's creatures and these kind of fussy Victorian women banging on about feathered hats, um, an issue I'm gonna talk about tonight. That, had, uh, that was now in the past and ornithology was about science very much in the fifties. And it was like a sort of bad smell in the past, I think. And it, for whatever reason, it was too complicated to exhume them. And it, it is a complicated story to tell, and it could be, it could be told in a very boring way, but you have, to, you have to bring these characters to life, immerse yourself in their world, let them speak, find the photographs, which is what I set about doing, uh, partly out of a sense of indignation that, that you share David, you know, for goodness sake, you know, this is Britain's biggest conservation charity. Why haven't we heard of them? And it, it, the RSPB did make it very, very difficult for me to do my research. They refused to let me back to their archives. They were very suspicious of me. And I know this because a, a chain of emails got sent to me by mistake by some of the um, the male birders at the high table uh, who'd been there forever, one said to the other, he said, I, I, I must say this kind of thing does worry me. What is her agenda? She's not a birder. And I mean, I didn't really set out to, with an agenda, but by then I thought, well, there kind of is only one agenda and that kind of has to be feminist because they have to be put back into the conservation narrative. Um, Otherwise, it, it's, it's a false narrative. Um, so it made me doubly determined. Well, I'm glad you were. And thank you very much for this, because I think, you know, this uh, is going to open up a lot of um, cans of worms out there for people reading. Um, interesting you say about the early ornithologists, because most, I mean, the ornithology um, was deemed and probably still is in a way deemed as a, a man's world. And even though, I mean, I, I knew you were coming today, so I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have a look and see just how many birds have been named after women, or, you know, because of the fact that they discovered them or they worked on them. And there's quite a few, there's Mrs. Well, there's quite a few birds with women's names, like Mrs. Moreau's Warbler or Feckler's Lark or Mrs. Hume's Pheasant. But they're all named after, I mean, the husband discovered it or the husband was the one that actually did all the work theoretically and then oh I'll, I'll name it after my good lady I think there's only a couple I could find Ele Eleonora's falcon 
and Lady Amherst's pheasant. And Lady Amherst's pheasant was um, f named because the woman that found it, maybe it was Lady Amherst, I'm not sure, but she actually procured the first sort of body, the first um, you know, specimen, and they named it after her. So it's really hard to find species named after women. And I just find that really, I, I don't know what it's like for the rest of the taxa in terms of, you know, amphibians and stuff. Maybe there might be someone here tonight who might know a bit more, but I was appalled by the very lack of, you know, women that have been honoured um, by being named after species. I think what you said just then about Mrs. Amherst Pheasant, about she was the one who, who shot it, I think that is the key because the, the men who got the species named after them, they procured the birds by shooting them. Yeah. You know, they had them stuffed and then they, they kind of presented them. And on the whole, certainly in the 19th century um, uh, and early 20th century, w women did things differently. They weren't going to be shooting the birds. Um, it was very hard for them to get into the field. They didn't have the right kind of gear for a start. It wasn't a woman's place. Um, and they didn't want to shoot them. They wanted to watch them. And the first bird watching book, which is it's called by Florence Merriam, it's called, um, I think it's called something like Bird Watching Through an Opera Glass, 1889. And she she recommends you use these little opera glasses in your back garden, because that's frankly where you know the only access to green you're probably going to get if you're a, a busy woman. And um that was her guide and it's about the bird's behavior their characteristics it's about an emotional connection and it's not about proof or lists or, or you know kind of the feather colors or um it's about what we call today the the jizz of the bird the character of the bird as perceived by by these women so may, maybe that's why species haven't been named after them because because they never shot them interesting well, let's let's look at your story. Let's hear about these women, and then perhaps we can have a chat afterwards. Yes. Now I'm going to start right. by showing you. Well, asking you. I don't don't want, don't unmute yourselves. But what bird does this come from? Now the the colour um, is dye. Actually, it's not originally black. And it, in fact, it doesn't grow on the bird in such a big tuft because this end, I don't know if you can see, is, is wired. It's a Victorian millinery adornment. These are, of course, egret feathers from the, the great little egret that rise up off the, off the chest and the back during the mating season. And by 1903, an ounce of these feathers was worth twice its weight in gold. Can you imagine that? and fortunes were being made in the plumage trade, plumage hunters, uh, because every woman of every class in every so-called civilized country of the world wanted to wear what was called oddly the osprey, because I'll stand back here, it, it adds great sort of height and um, backlit by the sun when it's undyed, it gives you this kind of lovely halo. And even if it was just a tiny little tuft, women wanted to wear it. Now this is just one of the species, but it became the kind of central focus of the RSPB's um, hard hitting campaign in the Edwardian era. So come with me backwards in time and I will share with you the, the journey that I went on. And for, for those uh, watching um, here tonight, if you go to speak of you, you can get the whole picture not on gallery view. Okay, so I had heard a rumour that the RSPB had been started by women. Um, as, as David said, I, 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 a birdie friend had, had told me this. So I did a bit of research online because I thought, well, that can't be true. I, I surely would have heard about it. And the image that kept coming up was this, this rather gloomy parade of Edwardian men. Um, with their, their egret placards. And the message seemed to be that these were the forefathers, these chaps. If it wasn't for them, there would have been no RSPB. I thought, well, that's odd. Um, and I asked around people I know who work in the RSPB and they said, yes, yes, th these are our founders. Have you seen the founder photograph? 
thought, oh, well, gosh, perhaps it's just one of those rumours. Um, but I thought perhaps if I went to the headquarters at Sandy and, and asked to see the archives, I might find something, just, just a clue to, to tell me if this was right or wasn't right. So off I went and I had a good look through a great heap of a jumble of photographs and old papers and came across rather a lot of photographs like this. I think this is the staff cricket team that served to confirm that ornithology is a bit of a bloke's club and the RSPB particularly a bloke's club. And I think it's safe to assume the two dolly birds in the middle there are the secretaries. Um, where, where were these women? And I, I got very dispirited and, until I found a box, a box about this big and written in very old handwriting on the lid of the box was the word contraband. So I prized off the lid and I shook out onto the table in front of me. Something that took my breath away, not what I was expecting at all, a collection of feathers. And not just feathers, but just like the one I've showed you just now, these were dyed, curled, wired, they were millinery adornments belonging to species that are now protected. We've got grebe, we've got egret, paradise. So in this box was the clue, the very origins of the RSPB. It was all about hats, women and hats. How extraordinary. And this box took me backwards in time to an era where every woman of every class wore a hat. You didn't leave home without a hat. You owned several hats. You refreshed your look each season. I found something else in the archives that intrigued me. This portrait. Now this is Etta Lemon, Margareta Lemon, pictured here as a Miss Margareta Smith. And there were some anecdotes that clung to her that have survived. She was militant from a very early age. Etta would go to her family church in Blackheath. Here it is, St Margaret's Lee. And when the congregation rose to sing, all things bright and beautiful, whatever, she would take out a little pocketbook and a pen and she would look beadily round the congregation and she would write down the name of every woman wearing a bird hat. Write down her name. Write down, if she could, the species. Quite hard to make out what the species was often. They would be dyed, they would be cut in half, put together with something else. And then she would go back to her family home. And this is Etta as a young woman, what we call a teenager today. So very bold and daring for the, the early 1880s. She would write each woman a letter calling out the cruelty entailed in this kind of a fashion statement. Had these women any idea that the birds had probably been shot during the nesting season, leaving chicks starving on the nest? Had they thought about it? Had they? Well, no, they probably hadn't. So Etta became the central focus of my investigation into these women. And I think it's important to have a look at what women were wearing on their heads in 1889, which is the year that the, um, the Society for the Protection of Birds was founded, and we'll come on to that in a minute, some pretty weird fashions were going on. Now I'd heard about feathers on hats, but I hadn't reckoned on whole birds on hats or several birds on hats. These are from the, this trade magazine, the Millinery Record. And as you move on through time, the avian pile up on the heads of women just gets greater and greater, bigger and bigger, and the hats get wider and higher. And this isn't just Britain, this is America, this is throughout Europe, this is throughout the British colonies. And as you can imagine, the effect on bird life when women are all trying to imitate these fashionistas of the day was absolutely devastating. On the right there is Lily Elsie, star of the Merry Widow Operetta, 1908, and she's wearing on her head black dyed Rajiana Bird of Paradise. This is the hat 
every woman wanted. The Merry Widow Hat, it was called. And it, it had a, a profound and appalling effect on the plumed paradise birds of New Guinea. Uh, you can see these extraordinary creations in museums today, and they haven't faded with time. And there is something really disturbing about them, I can tell you. They're both voluptuous yet savage. And um, Museum of Brighton I went to, the v &A, Museum Ulster, the, the Met in New York has a great collection. Can you imagine wearing this kind of thing on your head? Now, did, did anyone care? Well, fortunately, yes. So our story starts in Didsbury in Manchester, as David was telling us, at this house, this substantial Victorian house called The Croft, where a solicitor's wife, as she's always referred to, Emily, did Emily Williamson, aged 34, was so appalled at the plight of this beautiful bird, the crested grebe, a milliner's favourite, partly for those head ruffles that rise up during its extraordinary mating dance, but also for its very soft downy underpelt. There were by now 22 nesting pairs left in Britain and they were on their way to extinction and all for women's fashion. So Emily wrote, a pleading letter to the British Ornithologists Union, the all-male BOU, saying, please, will you take a stand against this awful fashion? Will you, will you say something? And we know that they wrote back to her a, a letter that really angered her. They said, in so many words, they said, excuse me, but we are women of science. We shoot birds, we stuff them, and we study them. And we are not going to get involved in this little anti-fashion skirmish. So in her anger, Emily founded in 1889, the All-Female Society for the Protection of Birds, very much excluding men because she thought, well, the men are doing nothing to protect the birds. I'm going to do something about it. So Disbury was one of my places of pilgrimage uh, at the beginning of my research. And I looked all around the house for the blue plaque and I couldn't find anything until I found in a very sort of dank passageway, this, I'll read it out for you. It was put up at the centenary, Action for Birds, 100 Years. This plaque is to celebrate the centenary of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. The unveiling was performed by the society's president, Magnus Magnusson. Da, 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 where the society was founded 100 years ago. So I read this once, I read it twice, thinking, am I missing something here? Am I, but where's her name? This is 1989. Emily's name is not on the plaque. Um, I got back to the archivist at the RSPB and said, um, do you have any images of Emily Williamson? Do you have anything at all? And she said, no, sorry, you won't find anything. We've searched and searched. A bomb hit the London headquarters during the Blitz and it took out all those early archives. And uh, sorry, but well, I took this as a bit of a challenge um, as a, a former investigative journalist got onto Ancestry.com and before too long, I had tracked down a living relative who was astonished to hear about the connection that his great aunt founded the RSPB and he sent me that day this image. And I was particularly pleased that she was so young and beautiful because at the time of the unveiling of the dreadful plaque, a Mancunian reporter had said um, the RSPB was founded by a stout Victorian lady. Just an easy cliche. Here she is. So Emily started writing letters to the press, people started taking notice, and she began to ruffle feathers, shall we say. Meanwhile, down south, very same year, another group of women were gathering. Now, 
this was a rather dispiriting place of pilgrimage. Um, I cannot really recommend Moreland Road in Croydon to anyone. Um, I think this was Eliza's house, Eliza Phillips, who ran the Fur, Fin and Feather Folk. It has since been demolished since I took this picture, but something rather extraordinary happened here too. And isn't it odd that it was the same year, a bit of a hive instinct. Now, sadly, we have no image of Eliza. She was back then a 67 year old rector's widow, highly active in the RSPCA. So I've got a stand in. I found an image in a Victorian photograph album of the era, an anonymous album. And I thought you are going to be Eliza. I need a face. I need a kind of intelligent, shrewd face for my story just for me sort of imaginatively so let's pretend this is Eliza with her fur fin and feather folk all women and amongst their number was Miss Etta Smith and it was Etta who suggested that they focus on just one issue I mean there were so many in this high Victorian era um, you know the, the cruel bearing rain on horses the appalling abattoirs live animal vivisection you know where to focus she said, the bird hat. If we are a single issue campaign, we stand a far greater chance of making an impact. I think the same is very true today. So that's what they did. And taking note of these two all-female campaigns, firing off letters to the press and signing up women with a pledge to wear no feathers was the good old RSPCA and it brokered a meeting between the two societies. It put them together and said, if you combine forces, you stand a far greater chance of getting your message out there. So that is what happened. And the reins were taken up by Eliza Phillips and Etta Smith. The nerve center was a desk at the RSPCA's German Street headquarters in London. And they needed a toff for a president. I think every charity needs an aristocrat, probably as much today as then. Their goal was legislation. They needed someone who could push it through, the House of Lords, then the House of Commons. And Winifred, Duchess of Portland, ravishing, 28 years old. No, she was 26 years old. Etta was 28. She was 26. Goddaughter to Queen Victoria, very well connected vegetarian, teetotal, interesting woman, already highly active um, on the RSPCA. She'd made pit ponies a bit of a cause of hers. She became president to her death. And this little society began to grow. As it turned out, women were rather good at networking. Lots of male ornithologists sneering on the sidelines um, and rather patronizing uh, little articles in newspapers, always with the headline, birds and bonnets. So in 1891, it had a thousand members. Six months later, 5,000 members. Two years later, 10,000 members. And so it went on doubling and doubling. It got the Royal Assent in 1904. By then it had 152 branches, not only throughout Britain, but throughout the British Empire. Most of them run in an entirely voluntary capacity by women. When the constitution was drawn up in 1891 to, to merge these two societies, Etta's eyes met the eyes of the young barrister who was doing the legal documents, Frank Lemon, and they married two years later and became very much the power couple of their day. They had no children and that is common also to Emily Williamson and Eliza Phillips. The birds became their life and, and running this, this society really absorbed them from this point on. So how did they campaign? Well, they used the popular satirists of their day to great effect. Um, this is by Lindley Sanborn and Punch was very supportive, the Times was supportive, the Spectator. This bird of prey, you might laugh at this ridiculous parody of a Victorian woman with feathers and claws, 
chasing after these poor birds. But just look at what they were wearing in this era. I mean, not so very different. They also had their own magazine after a while called Bird Notes and News. And um, here's a, a cartoon called A Killing Hat. And again, it looks a bit ridiculous, but actually wearing half an owl on your head was a thing in the 1890s, um, combined with all sorts of other things, wings, feet, tails. And again, just look at what women were wearing. The budgie hat. This is in the Met today. And it was a very difficult campaign because their targets were women, other women. This was kind of sisters against sisters. They had to not only sign women up, the pledge to wear no feathers, they had to put word out and whether that meant haranguing their own friends um, perhaps through kind of the medium of a tea party, which is how Emily Williamson did it originally, or, or lecturing in schools, they did magic lantern slideshows. And it wasn't just those sort of twittering high class women at Ascot, but it was also working class girls. And, you know, a very hard class to reach, the servant class as they were known because why shouldn't they look their best on their rare Sunday afternoons off? These are girls who worked in the East End in the rag trade um, on a special day out in the Sussex countryside. And they had things like feather clubs, these girls. They would all chip in however many pennies they could. One of them would buy a plume and they'd take it in turns to wear it. Um, so it was, it was a, a, a difficult campaign, difficult to not seem kind of fun denying, unpopular, finger wagging, a bit like the temperance movement. But their real target, of course, was the plumage trade. And this was a, a fiendishly slick operation worth a lot of money to Britain. I think I worked out it was worth then as much as our hair and beauty industry is worth for us today, which is some 20 million today. Um, ships laden with feathers would dock at the Port of London. They'd be unloaded. The wares displayed in these vast sorting houses, um, Cutler Street, and then to the Mincing Lane auction houses where lots of feathers would come under the hammer, first every fortnight, then every week. And um, these are displayed a board of hummingbirds. This is how they, they were pegged out to be sold uh, and sold in extraordinary quantities. So I looked at some of these auction brochures. One auction in 1888, this is the year before the RSPB started, um, under the hammer in one auction, 8,000 parrots, 1,000 impian pheasants, 1,000 woodpeckers. 1,400 little orcs and great crested grebe, 7,000 starlings, jays and magpies. So it wasn't just exotic birds, it was British species too. 12,000 hummingbirds, one lot. 5,000 tanagers, 6,000 blue creepers, and so it goes on. And they were sent off to be turned into these extraordinary otherworldly millinery adornments. Um, you could barely tell in some instances what the original species was. So clever were, were the, the feather workers in their art. Um, I found boxes of these in War, Wardown House Museum in Luton in the attics. The curator said, she said, yeah, I think we've got some boxes of feathers up in the attic. So up we went. I mean, piled high these boxes. They're Victorian. They'd never looked in them before. So we prized the lids off. And this is what they were full of, these millinery adornments. I became quite obsessed in my research by the women who worked with feathers, because after all, they were part of this great commodity chain. Uh, they stood to lose their jobs if the RSPB women got their way and banned the plumage trade, stopped the import of feathers. Here is one, Alice Battershall. She was sent to prison for two weeks hard labor for stealing two ostrich plumes. 
she worked as a feather washer, which was a really unsavory kind of link of this chain that the bottom of all the jobs. And she pushed a plume up each sleeve and she was discovered. She was stealing to the orders of her mother, Emma, who was running a little feather fencing ring in Finsbury. Alice is one. And we can spy into the lives and working conditions of these women by a series of reportage style photographs taken at the turn of the century in New York's Lower East Side by Lewis Hine. So the feather workers were concentrated in London's East End, New York, Lower East Side and Paris. And this was a, a, a horrible profession. Your lungs got filled with this feathery particulate these women had hacking coughs, they had running eyes, they had in inflamed uh, noses, um, rhinitis, and the pay was very low. Alice Battershall was earning five shillings a week. You couldn't live on five shillings a week. And it was no secret that these women moonlighted as prostitutes to stay alive because it was seasonal work. Twice a year you'd be employed. Um, as feathers, the, the, the fashion went feathers, artificial flowers, feathers, artificial flowers throughout the year. It was, it was kind of very coded. It, it filtered down from the Paris fashion houses. And these were the women at the bottom of that chain. And I also discovered that children played their part because little fingers were very good at working with feathers. This is a family willowing ostrich plumes, tying fronds onto fronds onto fronds to create that heavy, lolling, full feather that was so um, sought after in that late Victorian Edwardian era. It's interesting to note that ostriches were an exception to the RSPB's no feather rule because they didn't die for their plumes and they were farmed in the Cape, British Cape, you know, South Africa. So that was a big industry that they didn't want to tangle with. It was just birds that had to die. So who was wearing the feathers? Well, I'm sorry to say that some of the worst offenders were the suffragists and the suffragettes. There's Millicent Fawcett in the middle there at the bottom. Quite a few dead birds on heads there. Uh, but one of the worst offenders of all, people hate to hear this, <laughs> was Emmeline Pankhurst, um, who rarely appeared in public without bird kind of wings and, and furs around her neck. Uh, she had gone to finishing school in Paris and she used fashion as a, 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 very politically because Emmeline believed that the suffrage movement had a bit of an image problem. It was really easy to lambast these women and, and caricature them as unwomanly, unfeminine in their pork pie hats and hobnail boots. She felt a bit of rebranding needed to go on. And so the suffragette, suffragettes, every time they gathered, dress was very prescribed. They had to wear white, green and purple and the bird hat was very much a part of their brand. It became quite the look for the emancipated woman of the era, a cry for eye to eye attention. And this wasn't lost on the satirists of the day. And I think the message behind this, this cat in the hat is you trust these women at your peril? Just look at what they're wearing on their heads. So where is Etta Lemon in all this? By 1911, which was uh, the time hats reached their kind of peak diameter. She was Lady Mayoress of Redhill and Reigate. Her husband, Frank, had been made mayor. And although she took a pretty dim view of the suffragettes' stunts, Mrs. Lemon was not one who felt that women should have the vote. She felt that their sphere was in local government and they had a lot of influence in the kind of charitable work she was doing. She knew that if her campaign had to keep in the public eye, they had to take a leaf out of the suffragettes book. They had to copy them. 
and yet they were quite conservative women on the whole and it would have been excruciating for them to step into the public realm i think like these suffragettes did note the hats i rather wish they had but instead they hired sandwich board men so these are not the founders of the rspb of course they're not they are hired men you know paid a pittance and in that year 1911 when the egret was in a really a really critical moment. You know, it was just teetering on extinction. Um, these men, bearing these placards, walked through London's West End in the summer sales, trying to shame women. The badge of cruelty, it was called, and this is the life cycle, if you like, of the egret. Um, slaughtered on the ground by plume hunters and the chicks starving on their nests. This, this beautiful bird, um, and this was the look that every woman aspired to, as I said at the beginning, there it is, the osprey. And the argument went that women were to blame because, you know, if they weren't wearing the plumes, the birds wouldn't be shot. Um, this is said to be Coco Chanel who started out her career as a milliner. This is a, a, a satirical cartoon from 1911. It was the kind of burning issue of the day, hard, hard to believe now. Um, Virginia Woolf jumped straight into this argument. She said, wait a minute, who's shooting the birds? Who's profiting from these feathers? Not women. So the, the placard men walked to and fro, showing images such as this taken by an Australian ornithologist Arthur Mattingly. Um, these are chicks starving on their nest. Their parents lie dead on the ground. They will die. Um, and this was pretty visceral, brutal stuff. Can you imagine if you're a, an Edwardian shopping lady, you know, going to Selfridges and the, these placards suddenly flash before you and you're wearing the plume? Um, they had to reach women's hearts and minds. And so they did everything in their power to do so. Um, Etta's nickname was the dragon, but I think you needed a dragon with a campaign like this because women seemed to be absolutely impervious. This campaign had gone on now for two decades. It went on for three decades before any kind of legislation was passed. It kept being chucked out of the House of Commons because of trade interests. Um, I'm quite pleased that it was our first female politician to take her seat in the Commons who got it passed. Nancy Astor came in and she said, for goodness sake, this bill has tremendous public support. Let's get it through. And we are celebrating its centenary on the 1st of July. No bird skins could be unloaded uh, at any British port. The, the import of exotic feathers was over. You could still wear them, you could still sell them, but it made it seem a rather disreputable, unpalatable look. And hats like this, this was made in Swansea in 1920, that women didn't really want to associate themselves with, with that kind of look anymore, thank goodness. Etta clung on at the RSPB. Frank died in 1935. She did not want to let go. And she had what I think we, we might call founder's syndrome. It was her baby. She'd given you know, 50 years of her life to it. And she really disapproved of things like long lens photography, the ringing of nestlings, you know, the, the scientific study of birds, if you like. For her, it was all about protecting them by providing uh, the right environment for them. Um, there was a series of watchers at, at these very early bird reserves throughout Britain that Etta ran and looked after, these, the eyes and ears of early bird protection. She was stabbed in the back, as it were, in 1939 by the young men that she'd ushered in to the RSPB's inner council. They wanted her out. And the extraction of Etta Lemon was very painful for all concerned, but particularly for her, um, kind of thrown on the scrap heap, really, not remembered. I found her grave, her 
Frank's gravestone. Look at that. I mean, nobody today has any idea. They're just another couple of Victorian non-entities in an English graveyard. So I've been very pleased in researching this book to put some names and faces back into the conservation nar narrative and to remember that eco-activists can take all shapes, sizes and genders. So my book came out in 2018 and the publishers very much wanted to sort of jump on the, the suffragette bandwagon. We were celebrating that centenary then. And um, finally, they have seen sense and it's just come out in paperback and Etta really is the heroine. I mean, Panker's story is woven in there. It is a book about women becoming political at, at this very kind of febrile era. Since it's come out, quite a few interesting things have happened. I said I found the photograph of Emily Williamson. Uh, the man who sent it to me, Sir Patrick Bateson, just happened to be a very respected scientist, fellow of the Zoological Society, um, the Royal Society. Sadly, he died in 2018, but his daughter, Melissa, who unveiled this brilliant crowd-funded plaque in Didsbury with Emily's name on in 2019, she works in a very interesting field. She is a bird scientist. She studies the foraging patterns of starlings. And she, like her father, had no idea of this family connection, which just shows how very modest Emily Williamson was. When she died, she just had a, just a couple of inches in the Times, which barely mentioned the RSPB because she had a roster of other good causes too, as those women so often did in that era. Um, and we now have a statue campaign. And this is the long list. We had entries from all over the world. It seems to have really caught people's imagination. A statue for Emily Williamson, RSPB founder. Um, a, an inspiring story that one voice can make a difference. We've narrowed it down now to a short list of four. Here they are. The sculptors are currently putting the finishing touches to their bronze maquettes. Four women. Now that wasn't conscious, that's just how it happened. Um, women who were very invested in this story. These are the other two. Um, they're at the foundries now and they will be unveiled in Didsbury, Fletcher Moss Park, once Emily's garden on the 1st of July. And as for Etta, I have to, we've animated her. How are we going to remember the dragon? This was actually animated by her great, great nephew, Tim Lemon, who, who works in, in the film business. And again, he knew all about Frank, but he had no idea that actually it was Etta who was the real driver. Um, the RSPB was, was Etta's. Frank had become honorary secretary when it got the, the R, the royal bit, the royal assent, because women couldn't be honorary secretaries um, when, a, when a charity had the royal assent. So Frank has kind of gone down in the annals as being the one. It was Etta. Well, I got this tweet from the RSPB after my book came out. Um, David said at the beginning, when you visit the lodge, Sandy, they're just portraits of men everywhere. And um, this is WH Hudson on the right, pride of place. They have exhumed the portrait of Etta, the dragon, who it was, you know, mouldering in the attic. They've restored it. They've rehung it opposite Hudson. And when this went out on Twitter, of course, the RSPB communicates by Twitter. Of course they do. Uh, somebody replied with this, and I'm sure he's not in the audience today. Jeff Heathfield said, RSPB promoting feminism. Is this what we pay our fees for? Now, I'd like to think if he was in the room with Winnie, Emily, Etta and Eliza, he might just keep his trap shut. So there we have it. I think I'll, I'll stop there and hand back to David, who's sitting in stunned silence. 
Well, firstly, Tessa, you are uh, an amazing storyteller, and I'm sure the Zoomers here will agree. Um, a lot of most of that story I did not know. And, you know, firstly, to see women wearing, sporting those hats, were, which were the fashion at the time, to me, they were, they look totally and utterly obscene. You know, they could never have been around today. And it's just, it's just shocking. And I think it just makes me feel even more angry in a way that the, the organization known as the RSPB sort of brushed all of that history under the carpet and you have to crowdfund in order to have these women recognized. I think that's, that's actually, absolutely, I'm sorry to say this, but despicable. I think it's despicable. <gasps> Yeah, we are money crowdfunding. Should be, <laughs> money should be put up straight away by those by those organisations or that organisation, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's absolutely despicable. I have to say though, the RSPB. Since I tried and and so hard to research the story, I feel it's changed. We have a new female CEO, Becky Spate. I sense a real change of culture, and she is a hundred percent behind that statue campaign, and they've really generously put in seed funding for these bronze maquettes part of their um um you know education arm i think um so they they've kind of got us on our way um they cannot fund the statue because they need their money for conservation and i i understand that although they're quite a rich charity um we are hoping to raise money in all sorts of other ways um and crowdfunding is very much part of that and it is going to be an an educational um um a, a sort of focal point i think a rallying point it won't just be a statue there'll be an education center there'll be a, a lot of uh, reaching out to young people and trying to inspire the next generation of conservationists well that's good to know i mean i've i've not actually met becky spate yet but i've spoken to her online and Yes, I agree. I think she seems to be a different animal in terms of, you know, and again, no disrespect to the previous CEOs, but she certainly seems a very different prospect. And I sense, and I agree with you, I sense that she is looking to change things a bit more than, than previously. But even so, I, I still, you know, aside from what's happened recently, I mean, I think a lot of that's down to the, the work that you've done you know, in terms of getting people to sort of turn around and look at things again. But why does it take that? Why did it take being shamed almost and to, 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 to react in the way that I should have reacted 100 years ago, if you ask me? Yeah, I'm looking at, at some of the chat here. Um, Jim Wright says feathers still feature in ladies' hats to this day. Yes, um, they are poultry, so-called barnyard feathers. And milliners are really clever at dyeing and cutting and sort of laser cutting and curling. But I think it's a bit of a slippery slope because once you start making turkey feathers look like flamingo feathers, as sported by Camilla Parker Bowles at, I think it was the latest royal wedding, um, the next step is you're actually perhaps wearing those, those protected species and calling them vintage. Um, it's, you know, where do you draw your line? And, and even those barnyard feathers come mostly from farms in China and Russia. And I think it's probably safe to assume that, that you know, conditions are not that great. Um, so I, I am pretty nervous when I see <laughs> feathers anywhere these days. Um, yeah. Well, OK, we've got the statue on the way. You know, things are being put right, I suppose, in many respects. But what does that mean to the average person on the street? It's all very well, you know, us sitting here because we all know about the RSPB. Many of, many of us are members or, you know, do work with the RSPB. How is that going to reflect on the average person on the street and in particular women? Well, we don't have many statues of women, do we? So I, I think it's important to um, redress the balance a bit. But I'm, I'm hoping that the statue will be a, it will start a conversation going, not just about representation of women, but about bird protection. I mean, you know, let's be honest, we are, we have a biodiversity crisis and our skies are emptying of birds. And 
you can't really just shrug your shoulders anymore and think, well, well some, someone else will, you know, it, it's down to us as individuals to somehow do our bit. And, and I think it can seem like an absolutely overwhelming um, sort of, and terrifying, particularly to the younger generation. So to have any kind of role model that shows that something can snowball, that individuals can start something, that you know, just a group of friends can start something, and it does start in your backyard. It really does. The RSPB women were the first to introduce bird feeders and bird boxes to Britain. I mean, it's like they've been around forever, but no, they they looked at what was being sold in Germany. Germany was was very kind of early to do this beautiful woodwork. They they imported them, then they got carpenters to copy them. They sold bird seed. This is in the 19th century. People never thought about feeding birds before. They had kind of no real relationship with birds. So it's a continuum as far as I see it. And you have to keep that sense of a relationship. It's not about a life list. It's not about ticking things off. Um, it's about how we and the birds, you know, share this planet together. Um, as far as I see it. And even if you've got a feeder in your back garden, you're helping. If you're having a no mo may in your little, you know, front lawn, even you're doing something. Wouldn't you agree, David? Oh, totally, absolutely. In your research, um, did you feel that things generally within the conservation world are changing? Do you think that there is more space for women now, or do you think do you still feel it's a it's a male dominated arena? I think there is more space for women now. Um, I don't think they're very good at shouting about it. I think that, that the men, I mean, if you go to bird fair, all the kind of celebs talking are men <laughs> um, and they do dominate all those talks. Uh, there are lots of women scientists. There's a, a group of, a Facebook group of women in conservation that was started as a result of a chat that came out of bird fair kind of saying, but where are all the women? women are doing extraordinary things. And the RSPB, I think now has tipped the balance, slightly more women working within it than men now. Um, I think more needs to be done to encourage young people, young women um, into these kind of fields that the sciences particularly, uh, there needs to be more of a push on that. Um, but no, I, I think, I think it's looking good, but I think there is still a bit of a macho culture and it's all about how expensive are your binoculars and, you know, um, how first were you, how, how quickly did you get onto that kind of twitch where you spotted the whatever. Um, and maybe that will always be with us, the people who like to make lists and have that kind of brain. Um, but no, I, I think a lot has changed, particularly in the last three years and oddly it all started with, with the suffragette centenary getting so much airspace and then the Me Too movement hot on its heels. No, and it, just thinking about the BLM movement too, that was very quick, wasn't it? And it's already creating quite a lot of change high up um, and in the media, for example. So I think we do have the power to, to kind of kickstart revolutions, probably thanks to social media today. Okay, well, we've got some more questions coming, but uh, we've come to uh, the hour point of this evening. And it's been, I mean, again, it's one of these evenings that I could uh, be here for another two or three hours chatting with you, Tessa. But I need to ask you a very important question. And that question is, are you ready? You know, well, I can't even say you're sitting down because you're not. I'm important. <laughs> no, I'm standing up. Um, what is your, um, what is your favourite tree? Well, it just has to be the English oak. Um, and I, I live in Hastings. I walk in the Sussex Weald um, all the time. And it's the oak supports about 300 species are dependent on the oak. Um, there are things like the oak loop string moth, the, the oak leaf roller beetle that couldn't live without the oak. It's, it's the giving tree. So I wish, you know, developers would plant more oaks instead of little rowan trees. Um, yeah, they're, they're there for life. 
Fantastic. And uh, if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the latest pandemic, and I use the word latest because I think there's more to come. But anyway, um, what, where would you be right now? Well, I think I'd be in the um, Ruwenzori Mountains in Uganda, where um, I went in the footsteps of my father to see what it was that kind of sparked his fire. And you don't need binoculars to birdwatch there. They're right in front of you. And my young son, I took him, he was 13. He's on the autistic spectrum and he revealed this extraordinary capacity to kind of photograph mine, to, to see and name whatever he was looking at. Um, so, you know, maybe he's gonna follow in dad's footsteps, who knows? Fantastic. Um, the Zoom is just to let you know, but there's only two more um, interviews or conversations actually um, left in this series. And the next of which is gonna be on Thursday at seven o'clock BST. And it's with a guy called Paul McGuinness and you've never heard of him, I'm sure, but he's the editor of the most famous wildlife magazine on the planet, BBC Wildlife Magazine. And he's gonna be here to talk to us about how it's put together and all these sort of backstage stories. So that could be, in fact, not even could be, that will be an interesting evening. And finally, on Monday the, 30, the 28th, even not the 31st, the 28th, we have a guy called Joe Shute, a fellow journalist. Um, and he's written a book called, What Do You Know About the Weather? And he'll be talking just about that particular subject. So two good things to come up. Um, Tessa, uh, it's been a fabulous evening. You are a great raconteur. Um, really enjoyed the story, even though you know it's true, and even though I feel enraged slightly afterwards and angry and a little bit kind of you know sickened by what I saw. But it's a good story and a story that everyone needs to hear about. So thank you so much for for coming tonight and also for for writing your book. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Zoomers, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, yeah, it's been, you know, I, I'm lost for words actually tonight. <laughs> so I'll just say it's been great. And all of you guys, take care of yourself and don't forget to keep looking up.